Okay, it's about time to begin our Bible class. We are in a study of Genesis. Last week, David focused on the test with Abraham being called upon to offer Isaac. And last we spoke, um, before that, we were discussing Abraham and Sarah. And we're going to, to jump back uh, in time a little bit and focus a little more on Abraham and Sarah because I think there are some good good lessons for us to learn uh, from that. And then if we get to that, finish that, then we'll jump forward into uh, Jacob and Esau. So that's kind of our plan today. And I'm hope, hoping you're able to, to somewhat follow the syllabus and stay up with the reading. These are accounts that we've heard over the course of our life and maybe new to some, may not to others. Uh, but I'm kind of relying on that when we, when we get to class here. So again, Abraham and Sarah, and then we will jump to Jacob and Esau once we get to that point. So we reach a point where God changes Abraham and Sarah's name. Changes Abram to Abraham, you will be the father of nations, and Sarah to Sarah, she'll be a mother of nations. We have other name changes, Jacob to Israel, uh, Simon to Peter, and then we have a name change as well. What, what is the significance of a name change in the Bible? Okay, expects a change. A change in their direction, a change in their, their mindset, a uh, change in their future. That's good. That's good. What else? They're reborn. It's a, maybe a new calling of sorts, um, for sure. Uh, it, maybe it even marks a milestone in someone's, in someone's life. So we see these name changes. What is the significance of our name change, of being a sinner and then becoming a Christian? What's the significance of that? Relationship with God, it marks a milestone. It marks a new direction. Maybe it, uh, hopefully it reflects a change of heart. The same things that we discussed under the name changes for Abraham, Sarah, Jacob, Peter, all, all of those uh, name changes. So there's an important aspect to that. It's not just a name. When we put on Christ, we're changing our direction and our mindset and marking a, a new milestone in our life. Okay, so then we move on and we have these three visitors that show up at Abraham's tent. Did, did Abraham know who these visitors were? He, had a, he probably had a good idea of who they were because it says there in that, that passage that one, just the way he, he responded to them, but um, it says that... Uh, he calls them my Lord, capital L, and if that's a proper translation, he knew. And in the way he, he fell down uh, on his knees, another indication. If you're just being hospitable to visitors coming in, you're probably not going to fall down on your knees and call them my Lord. And there may be something unique to the way they arrived. I'm not sure. They could have they walked up to the tent, or they could have just materialized there at the door of the tent. If you're if you're in an encampment like that, usually the most important people are in the middle of the camp. So be able, to, be able to make it to somebody's tent like Abraham without some introduction, some commotion, uh, seems not likely. Um, but anyway, they made it to the tent. Abraham falls on his knees, calls one of them, my Lord, and he wants to make them a morsel of food. And he references himself as a, the visitor's servant, the visitor's servant. And we see different aspects of, of Abraham throughout the course of Genesis. We see this, what typically is, this kind of stoic individual. And when Lot is kidnapped, we see this extremely brave individual. And in this visit, we see this, this humble servant. And that's a unique perspective on Abraham. And there's almost this sense of urgency as you read through this passage. And he's, he, he goes to Sarah, and he almost, you know, I'm thinking Sarah's, you know, probably cooked a few cakes in her day. 
And he goes to Sarah and he kind of gives her this cooking lesson. He comes up to her and he's like, okay, look, you got to get this, get a full level, get three full levels of meal. Don't, don't chinch it. Get three full levels of meal and knead it this time. Knead it this time, you know, because last time you started, I don't know. And the, but then he, he says, um, uh, make cakes out of it. Make cakes out of it. That's, that's what we want. We want the cakes. And so she does that, you know, and, 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 and he, I, I don't know. I, I don't know what I would do if I was in the presence of the Lord like that. I probably would just not be able to speak. But evidently, people handled this very well when they were in the presence of the Lord. That must not have been that uncommon of a thing. But I can't imagine me, you know, having somebody prestigious over and going to Michelle and say, "Hey, you know, you got to make these. You got to make these cupcakes. Not the not the 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 twelve hole pan, the six hole pan, the really big ones, and don't chinch on the sugar and flour and." And, you know, pile it up, make, it, make them rise up. She would probably take the pan and say, here, you do it. Um, but Sarah handled that well. And Abraham goes on and, and he, he runs to the, where the herd is. And he, he gets the, the young man there to, to get a calf and get it, get it cooked and get it prepared. And he comes back. And, and so while they're eating, what kind of interaction is going on there between Abraham and the three visitors? What's Abraham doing? He's just standing there, right? I mean, he's just standing there. He is truly being the servant for those three people, not just any visitors coming in and having a meal with them and demonstrating hospitality. He's standing there. They're sitting. He's standing. He's trying to fulfill his role and what he feels like it should be there in the presence of um, at least one of those being the Lord. Okay, so, so why the visit? Why, why do you think there's this visit? Okay, and from, from what perspective? What part of the promise? Oh. Yeah, that Sarah would have a child, exactly. It's confirmation, it's more detailed, it's more specific than we've ever heard before. We know when and, and so forth, and, and it's confirmed. Um, so that's definitely one reason that for this visit, for sure. What's, what may be another reason? And you may have... I mean, you may have to speculate to a certain degree, but what would be another reason for this visit? Yes, sir. Yeah, I think it served as a test probably both for Sarah and Abraham. It wasn't that they didn't know uh, necessarily. Sarah, maybe not to the degree of Abraham, but when God or the Lord asked uh, Abraham, why did Sarah laugh, who was behind the tent door, I'm not sure even Abraham knew that she was around, and he says, why did Sarah laugh? Abraham wouldn't even have known that she laughed. So it's kind of this demonstration that th these are some special people. Um, yes, sir, go ahead. Another reason. Obviously, uh, Abraham and Sarah decided to take matters into their own hand and, and had Ishmael, and God's letting him know Ishmael is not the promised son, and uh, Isaac will be the one who will be the, from whom your descendants are chosen. Right, right. That definitely, that, that this is God's plan in his time um, and of his choosing. And then they ask Abraham, where's Sarah, your wife? Not Sarah, your sister, but Sarah, your wife. Uh, this time Sarah laughs within herself, um, and, and really this is the first time where... Um, they're having kind of this, this discussion. And I have up here why the visit. I think one of the reasons, maybe, um, to be referred to as the friend of God, that's pretty powerful. That's a pretty powerful thing. Um, and, and it's in several places within the Scripture. Second Chronicles 20, Abraham referred to as God's friend forever. In Isaiah 41, at the end of that verse, the descendants of Abraham, my friend, James 2, 23, Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness and he was called the friend of God. Again, that's, that's powerful stuff right there. Um, and there, there may be another reason why he came, and that is just 
to have this interaction with Abraham on, on somewhat of a human level because he was God's friend. And then maybe another reason would be that he wanted this to be a, a, an occasion that was remembered by Abraham. Something he would never forget. Because we talked about why was God going to communicate this information about Sodom and those other cities' judgment. Because he felt like he could trust him to pass that down. And he wanted this to be an occasion that, that uh, Abraham remembered. In, in my family, we kind of have these little amusing things that, that have happened to generations that are passed down. And, and my grandfather, <clears throat> they owned a small cafe in, in McKinney, Texas. And it was just a hole in the wall. wasn't anything special. Um, probably didn't even have a lot of customers. But one day, Bonnie and Clyde came in to their cafe and just terrified my grandfather because this was kind of at the height of Bonnie and Clyde. And they sat down at a table. And my grandfather came up and he said, look, we don't want any trouble. And they said, we don't either. We're just hungry. We want something to eat. So they made him something to eat. And he walked back up to the table and said, you know, when you're done, leave. And they, they did eat. They left. They left him a huge tip, um, and he tried to give it back, but it was Bonnie and Clyde, and you didn't force that too much. And then as I was growing up, my dad received a call one evening, and it was Howard Hughes on the phone. And that's back, you know, there's no cell phones, and when you paid for a, uh, when you made a, a, a call, you pay a long distance call, you paid for it in advance. And so... There was a Bill Greer that worked for Hughes Tool that was evidently high up in that organization, and um, he thought that the Bill Greer in Houston that was my dad was that person, and it wasn't. And so Howard Hughes said, well, I've already paid for seven minutes of this call. Let's just talk. So, you know, we asked him later on, well, what did you talk about? And he said, oh, I don't know, just the weather and stuff till the seven minutes ran out, and then we said, said goodbye. But, you know, you look back on that, and you're like, really? I mean, you... Didn't ask for a job, you know, something. That, but anyway, that's, that, it, my dad remembers that. My grandfather remembers that. And, you know, I've always kind of wondered, what, what am I going to have to pass down? And I did have an event that is, it, we, it, I know political things are, you know, not, not necessarily discussed, but um, we call it the Ronald Reagan incident in our family and on my, on my record. But it was... We were invited to go see Ronald Reagan speak at NASA, and we were running late. We were running so late, we were really contemplating just turning around and going home. And we finally got to NASA. We went ahead and went through with it. We found a parking place in one of the most remote parking places. And so we had to walk across a field to get to where the president, a road that would take us to the venue where the president was speaking. And so as we were walking, we up on the horizon, you could see the presidential motorcade. And it was, you know, moving. And as we made it to the road, and we were walking up the road, and all of a sudden it makes the turn. And it's coming directly towards us. And there's nobody else around. Nobody else around except Michelle and I. I remember what, it made an impact on me. I know what Michelle was wearing. I remembered it was this bright yellow jumpsuit. She had this bright yellow thing in her hair. I remember it what, like it was, it was yesterday. It made a huge impression on me. One I'll never forget. But the, 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 motorcade came towards us, and I know that there were a bunch of Secret Service people saying, this was clear five minutes ago. I don't know who these people are, but the first few black vehicles pass, and there's the limousine. And so Michelle, I just told Michelle, I said, you've got to be kidding me. This is great. So we're standing right there. I could have touched the limousine, and we're waving. These big waves, big waves, and President Reagan and Nancy Reagan aren't looking. And they turn because they're both looking down at something in the back of the limousine. And so we're waving, and we see, and we get more aggressive, you know, and, you know, and I, th I knew, I thought at the last minute that Nancy and I made eye contact. And, and I call her Nancy because we made eye contact. But so the limousine slowed down and passed, and when it did, I stepped out behind it, and, I'm, and I don't see them turn around, and I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. And just when I did that, um, Nancy turns around, and she waves. And the limousine stops, and she taps Ronald Reagan on the shoulder and points to the back, and he turns around, and that boy's grin, and he, he waves. And I was, we were like, yeah, that's so great. That's so great. But what, what, what wasn't great uh, is you don't step out in front or behind or stop a motorcade. And 
It, yeah, and that, I, I mean, ultimately everything was okay, okay? So everything was okay, but I remember that event, but I think, okay, when I said I couldn't relate to how, you know, it would be like to be in the presence of God, and I'm not saying Ronald Reagan was God, and I'm not saying I'm Abraham by any stretch of the imagination, but if they would have stopped, rolled down the window, and President Reagan would have said, hey, we're hungry, we, we need to find a place to eat, we need to lay kind of low, you know, can you, can you help us out? Uh, I would have been like, yes, yes. Um, I tell you what, nobody would suspect you coming to our house, right? Nobody would suspect that. You're going to have to ditch a few of these cars, but nobody's going to suspect that. I'm going to go get some goodly steaks at the place. Michelle, you make those cupcakes in that six whole pan, okay? And make sure you don't chinch on the sugar and flour and, and, and make sure they dome up. So I can relate to that. And, I, and, and, and it's something that I'll never forget. And I think that's one of the reasons why we have this visit is it's so important that Abraham not forget that this is passed down from generation to generation. So, is there anything too hard for the Lord when, it, when that's the question that's asked, when Sarah laughs within herself? We, we, we talked about that. And the answer to that is what? Is anything too hard for the Lord? No, no. Nothing, nothing is too hard for the Lord. Okay, so what I'd like to do is turn to Genesis chapter 18, verses 22 through 33, and let's read that, and we're going we're gonna to talk about that. It's kind of an important event here, <clears throat> Genesis 18, 22. Then the men turned away from there, these are the three, three, two of the three visitors, and went towards Sodom. But Abraham stood still before the Lord. And Abraham came near and said, Would you also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Suppose there were fifty righteous within the city. Would you also destroy the place and not spare it for the fifty righteous that were in it? Far be it from you to do this. Such a, such a thing as this, to slay the righteous with the wicked, so that the righteous should be as the wicked? Far be it from you. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? So the Lord said, If I find in Sodom fifty righteous within the city, then I'll spare all the place for their sake. Then Abraham answered and said, Indeed now, I, I who am but dust and ashes have taken it upon myself to speak to the Lord. Suppose there were five less than the fifty righteous. Would you destroy all of the city for lack of five? And he said, If I find there forty-five, I will not destroy it. And he spoke to him yet again and said, Suppose there should be forty found. And he said, I'll not do it for the sake of forty. Then he said, Let not the Lord be angry, and I'll speak. But suppose thirty should be found there. So he said, I'll not do it if I find thirty there. And he said, Indeed, now I've, I've taken it upon myself to speak to the Lord. Suppose twenty should be found. So he said, I'll not destroy it for the sake of the twenty. And then he said, Let not the Lord be angry. And I'll speak but once more. Suppose ten should be found. And he said, I will not destroy it for the sake of ten. So the Lord went on his way as soon as he had finished speaking with Abraham. And Abraham returned to his place. So, what do we learn? I have some things up here about the petition. But what are some things that you take away from this petition? This, this interaction between the Lord and Abraham. God is patient. God is patient. He didn't stop Abraham from ratcheting down. And where do you think Abraham is kind of going with this discussion of the 50, 45, 30, 20, 10? He stops at 10. What, what could possibly be the rationale for stopping at 10? Do you think? Terry? Right. Uh, that, uh, Abraham uh, speaking. Okay, thank you. He was hoping that Abraham would speak on behalf of Lot and for the righteous. He was hoping that, in fact, 10 uh, people were right, righteous. Apparently, we found out that there were not even 10 righteous people. So the city was destroyed. Yeah, I think he's. <clears throat> I think Abraham is, as Terry said, we're, is is trying to get it to a number that 
that um, would extend Lot's life, possibly. And 10 just happens to be the number that would make up Lot, his wife, his two daughters, his two other daughters, their husbands, and his two sons. And so, whether that's the reason or not, he's trying, I think he's looking out for, for Lot again. Um, and also, maybe even for the city. I mean, th these are people that Abraham rescued, right? He's already rescued them once, a lot of them. And so he probably, even though they're an evil, wicked people, he has a soft place in his heart for them. And maybe there's a certain amount of, you know, Lot has to stand on his own. Maybe the next negotiation point would have been, if Lot is faithful, will you save the city? But he didn't. He stopped there. God didn't stop him from asking that, but Abraham stopped. He wasn't cut off. The Lord went his way. What did Abraham do after that? Did he mount a camel and hightail it to Sodom to get Lot to warn him? He went back to his place. Yeah, he went back to his place. Maybe Lot needed to stand on his own. So, you know, from that interaction, I think we learn a number of things the way Abraham approached God. He was respectful, almost self deprecating. He was humble. He was persistent, but not demanding. He was bold or, con or called upon to be bold uh, when we petition the Lord. He listened. They listened to each other. Abraham listened to God, and God listened to Abraham. God didn't demean him or get frustrated with him. The requests were not self-centered. It was all about the people and about Lot. He trusted God would do the right thing. He tried to change God's mind, or at least tried to find out what in the mind of God is. Is trying to change God's mind an okay thing to do? Kind of second guess that when after you know I put that in there. He changes his decisions, you know, and and and. I think to a certain degree, he's changing God's mind. God has his own mind, his ways. So I didn't mean it from that aspect. I meant it more from the aspect you were referencing. God changes his mind. Yes, God changes his mind. Thankfully, God changes his mind. And that's the account there in Exodus 32, 9 through 14, where God says... I am done with these people. Get out of my way. Let my anger burn against them. And we'll start over, just you and me, Moses. We'll start over, and I'll make you great. And, you know, Moses, who evidently has this trouble speaking, this alleged trouble speaking, gives one of the most eloquent responses to the Lord and saves the people. So, it's a comforting thing to know that we can change the decision-making of God. And just the impact of a few righteous can be life-changing for the whole. So, on that bullet, what do we, what do we learn? What, what can we learn from that? The impact of a few righteous can be life-changing for the whole. If we uh, um, order our lives in, in such a righteous fashion that it will not only uh, take care of us, but it will take care of uh, those that we love as well, uh, our, our friends and our relatives. Yeah, for sure, for sure. So should, go ahead. Oh, I just simply would say that we can make a difference. As James said, the prayers of righteous man availeth much. So you may feel like a, a very small part of this huge sea of humanity but we can make a difference. Right. It's not about quantity necessarily. <clears throat> and should we be including prayers for this nation in our conversations with the Lord? Absolutely. Every prayer, every day. I mean, if you care about your children or your children to come, this country has a lot of problems, but it's still the best place to live. Uh, there's no doubt. And, and and maybe we are the reason, or maybe we can be the reason that this nation continues 
um, like it has. So absolutely we need to be including that in our prayers. Ten people would save Sodom. A few Christians might be able to save this country. And we can't deny the power of God. Okay, so then the, the two angels, they head on to Sodom and Gomorrah. How evil was Sodom and those surrounding cities there? It was bad. It was really bad. When your name of your city becomes the basis for sodomy, then it's bad. That's a bad thing. Sodomy being the sin of Sodom. So Lot urges these angels, the two angels, to come to his house. And he feels like his house is a place of refuge, obviously, because these angels wanted to stay out on the square, right? And he was like, you, 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 can't, you can't do that. Not here, not now. You need to come to my house. So he goes, to, he goes to his house, and then all of the old and young from everywhere come, and they're banging on the door, and they want these angels for carnal reasons. And so Lot comes out, and he's trying to reason with these people. And he says, hey, I have two daughters. You know, take them instead. So it begs the question, was, was Lot a good father? Yeah, I mean, it, and it's hard to put yourself in that situation. And if, you, again, you keep thinking, okay, righteous Lot. He's referenced as righteous Lot. Maybe he wasn't, he, you know, he was just like a lot of us. You know, he, he, he stumbles and he falls and, and there are problems with certain decisions he makes. But whether it's to buy time because he knows these people that are with him are special to give them time to act to do something, whether he legitimately is going to give his daughters to um, the mob because these are special people. Um, and maybe he's willing to sacrifice some of his family for the sake of these people being safe and in returning to where they came from. Whatever, you know, this, this was a, a, a strange circumstance. Um, and you have to ask yourself, was Lot a good father? Were Lot's daughters good daughters? They were still virgins, right? I mean, so there's something to be said for that in a city like that. But they also had a scheme later on where they got Lot drunk, and Lot was willing to get drunk. It was a two-way street. Um, but sometimes these man-made schemes that, they, that are based on false assumptions, and what was the false assumption of their man-made scheme? And this was after the destruction, and they're leaving, and they're isolated in the mountains, and they, they claim what? They weren't going to have any children. There's nobody around except Abraham with his big group of people that they could have gone to, but in their mind, there was nobody else around. And then we get the Moabites and the Ammonites, which, uh, what's, you know, what's the future of God's people in, in conjunction with those two groups of people? Miserable, not good. I mean, the Moabite women must have been really something because they put a hurting on the men of Israel. They just could not resist them. And the Ammonite people, they were in constant conflict, conflict with, with Israel, for sure. But we look at this and we see this righteous lot. He's, he sits in the gates of Sodom. And we, we, we kind of look down on Lot because he went there, he got closer, he interacted with the people, he moved into the city. And so, you know, it's kind of like, okay, well, Lot, you, get, you made your bed, you lie in it. But what's another, what's, what's another way of looking at that from the big picture with Sodom and um, the people in Lot? Terry. Uh, uh, keep in mind also that Lot's son-in-laws, they were going to marry the daughters, but they took his advice as a joke. They, they did not re regard that the Lord was going to destroy the city. And, uh, of course, we saw, and, uh, notice what happens to Lot's wife when she looked back, when she, was, she and all the rest was told not, told not to look back. She became a pillar of salt, but that left his uh, daughters in a unique situation because the the son-in-laws uh, did not heed Lot's uh, advice to leave the city. 
Yeah, absolutely. They it, it kind of remind takes you back to the days of Noah, right? Where he had no luck uh, convincing very many people, other than his immediate family and his his uh, sons and daughters, to stay focused on the Lord. And he was a preacher, and he didn't have he didn't have any luck with that. And I'm sure there were people that that uh, scoffed and mocked, and and he probably experienced similar things. Um. But the, the one little glimmer of hope for the people of Sodom was the fact that Lot was there, right? He was evidently had a, a place of prominence, but here is a righteous person with a righteous family, and he is there. So the Lord is there. I mean, he's able to, to teach, right? To teach people. And so he doesn't fare any better than... Noah did, but he was there. They had a chance. They had an opportunity. All they needed to do was listen. And so he, he takes these, these angels to his house because he feels like that's a place of refuge. Does anybody in their house today, do you have, and maybe you do, have anybody banging on the door trying to get to you to brutalize your family? No, it's a place of refuge, right? And that's kind of what Lot thought. But he was able to stop them at the door. He was able to stop them at the door. So what's, what's, the, what's the scary thing today about our homes? We don't have people beating down the door trying to get to our family necessarily. But what's scary about our homes this day and time? Yeah. The conduits are past the door, right? The conduits for evil are past the door. Our cell phones are in our house, our smart televisions are in our house, the cable, if you've got it, is in your house, your computer's in your house. These are conduits. And so it's already in our house. But just like Cain, sin lies at the door, it lies at the end of those conduits, and we have to rule over it. So the scary thing about that is that's a place of refuge. And if we let our guard down, even within our house with those devices, we can end up just as bad off as the people of Sodom. And Gomorrah. Yes, Rick. Yeah. So he did take care of the righteous, and even in the midst of all of that illegitimacy between Lot and his daughters, came the nation of Moab, which came. Became, you know, Ruth came from that, married Obed, eventually we got David, and we get the Christ. So you never know the chain of events that God has in mind by saving the righteous, but he is looking after his people and make sure that his will is accomplished through all of that. Yes, good, great point. It, it, uh, even though Abraham didn't ask specifically to save Lot, we read in that passage that God remembered Abraham. And because God remembered Abraham, God remembered Lot. And that was the impetus behind saving Lot and his family, which were obviously fewer than ten and ultimately just three. But even though we deviate from God's plan, God's plan still moves forward. And I think that's an important takeaway. I think that's an excellent point. And God may use it to further his plan to accomplish his plan. And we even see that as we move forward with Jacob and Esau. There are some things that are questionable there, kind of like the midwives with the uh, people in Egypt where they, they lied. And there's a, a, a phrase in there where it says, God dealt with the midwives. So he doesn't condone these things, but they, he can incorporate them in a divine way to accomplish his, his plan. Okay, so... The evil men were struck blind as they were banging on the door. And I don't know if that's they, you know, they couldn't see or they were just disoriented. There seems to be some debate on that. But even Lot's life was threatened. They accused him of judging them. Um, so evidently Lot did have, did, did speak up. He wasn't trying to cover his faith. Um, and the angels urged Lot to head to the mountains. And Terry answered the question there, what did the son-in-laws think when he told them to get out of the place? They thought I was joking. But, but the angels tell Lot, look, you've got to get out. There's still this sense of urgency because this place is going down, and you've got to get out. So 
what is Lot's response to, you've got to head to the mountain? Yes, sir, Terry. City of Zoar. Oh, yeah. Excellent. He, he pleads for the city of Zoar that, they, uh, that if, if he could escape in there, uh, and that city would be saved from the, uh, uh, from the destruction of the rest of the cities. Yeah, exactly. He didn't want to go to the mountains. He didn't want to go to the mountains because he was fearful of his safety. And you're reading that and you're kind of like, really? Really? You're being rescued by angels, being told to go to the mountain, and you're scared to go there. So he wants to go to, the, to this city. But what's the significance of Lot going to that city? That's one of the cities that's on the list to be destroyed. So what, what, what results from Lot wanting to go to Zor? They saved themselves and they didn't choose it. He saves the city, right? The city's not destroyed. He said, it's just a small city. The, the angels agree. Um, ultimately, though, because of his safety, he has to go to the mountains. And that's where the daughters, land with Lot, um, comes into play. But even Lot saves Zor. And he's allowed to go there and get out. And we all recall his wife and the issue issue there. But we have these, these lessons from Lot. And the fact that God's judgment is real, and that's the way we should interpret that, that God, God's judgment is going to come and it's going to be real. It's not just this nebulous thing. God rescues the righteous. He makes examples of the evil. God hears the fervent intercession of a righteous person. Abraham petitions for the cities and saves Lot. Lot petitions to save Zor. Lots of petitions on other people's behalf and the power, power of petitions. And we're all going to be held individually accountable. His wife was, was turned to Saul. So individual accountability. You can't really judge a nation on the day of judgment. So when are nations judged? You can judge individual people, which will happen. Yeah, it right. could be the, the hand of God in there in this life, right? Uh, don't we see that all throughout the Bible, that certain nations, their sin is not yet mature and not ready, but when it is, they're going to be judged as a nation? I saw this quote from Charles Spurgeon, and it re kind of reminded me a little of Lot's life, a wife and, and maybe even us in certain instances. It says, the most miserable person in the world is the half-committed Christian who is just enough in the world to be miserable in God, and just enough into God that they're miserable in the world. So Jesus said it a lot simpler. You can't serve two masters. And she wasn't serving the Lord, so she had to be serving the other master. So that's a huge lesson from Lot's wife that we can take. Okay, I'm going to just barely touch on this. This is um, an account that occurs in Genesis 20. And again, this is... When Abraham, you know, Sarah, my sister, again, they visit, um, they're near Egypt again. Um, and so Abimelech takes Sarah in, and bad things happen to the house of the king. Their wombs are closed. Um, and when God talks to Abimelech and says, you know, the, you've got another man's wife. He immediately responds to Abraham and he says, why did you do this? Why did you do this? Why did you do this to us? And Abimelech tells God, he goes, you know, in my integrity, I wouldn't have done this thing had I known. And God says, yeah, I know. I know your integrity, but I didn't let you touch her. And Abraham responds, and he says, I did this, I said she was my sister because the fear of God was not in this place. Fear of God was not in this place. And that wasn't necessarily the case. And 
although we want to be sure if we have to move someplace, that there's, there's a, a place to worship. <clears throat> but I don't think we should make the assumption that the fear of God is, is not in a place and that there aren't hearts in a place. Definitely need to check things out if you're, you're moving, but that's one of those false assumptions that Abraham made. And Abraham had been given all these assurances from God that you know, you're going to be the recipient of this promise, Sarah's going to have this child, um, yet he stumbled several times in relation to um, his fear of, of people. Okay, some some Genesis from uh, some lessons from Genesis in this account. Uh, God will accomplish His will His way. He'll do what He promised, and His timing is not our timing. We see this sense of urgency here in this account of bringing judgment um, on on these cities, um, but we also see this the slowness of the coming child, the promised the promised child. Uh, we can't conceal anything from the Lord. Sarah laughed within herself, and the Lord knew baptism is necessary for salvation, as was circumcision. We talked about that a couple of three weeks ago. And God is involved in the affairs of men. Uh, and that's a comforting thing that He is, that He listens and He's involved. And don't assume that the fear of God is not in, in some place. Nations and cities are judged in this life, sometimes people as well. Uh, intercession does work. Abraham for Sodom, Lot for Zor. In that uh, account with Abraham and Abimelech, with Sarah, my sister, um, he had to, had to petition on behalf of Abimelech there before the Lord would lift that curse and open up the, the wounds. The presence of the righteous will preserve a city, even a small number. Be careful how we approach the Lord, humble, respectful, but be bold. Not everyone will heed God's warning. And even Lot... Well, what was interesting about Lot, after all he knew, what did the angels have to do to get him to leave? Eric? Uh, yeah, they had to take his hand, hand and, and lead him out. Yeah, they had to drag him out, if, even after all this stuff. So it's hard to leave family, friends, your home behind. And then salvation involves mercy. So I think that's the second bell. We'll leave it there. I didn't get to Jacob and Esau, so we'll just keep plugging away. David will be uh, up next week, and uh, we'll see you next week. I appreciate the comments.